Hi everybody, I'm really glad you can be here today. I know you could be doing other things outside or around the house and I really appreciate that you're here today. I'm hoping it'll be worth your while. Let's see what we can look at first here. We're going to talk about a few different things. Uh, perennial flowers are a big one this month and shrubs. Everybody's got questions about when you're supposed to prune and what you're supposed to prune. Some of the fruits need some care this month. And one of the things I keep finding popping up in my yard is creeping buttercup. And we'll talk a little bit, bit about that. This is the month in the springtime anyhow that you get your garden ready to go. And hopefully you don't have yours planted yet with the summer vegetables. There are a few garden pests that we'll, we're going to talk about more about where you can find information about them rather than about the individual pests. Same thing about the beneficial insects. We've got some tips about uh, lawn care and moss in lawn because that's a big, big question. And we'll touch on the different vertebrate pests that we have. So let's talk about the perennials. Perennials are wonderful because they come up every year. It's like seeing your old friend every time they show up. They don't need a whole lot of fertilizer, maybe just a small amount when the uh, plant is just fruiting, starting to come up and maybe when it's starting to uh, flower again. Uh, you'll want to divide them when they're pretty small so that they can still get growing for the rest of the season. The only ones that you don't want to divide right now are oriental poppies, the bearded iris, and the true lilies after they're blooming. And you should divide the peonies in the fall. Um, the floppy plants like uh, daisies and peonies, especially peonies because they're so top heavy, they need to have some kind of a support. I like to use those conical tomato cages, you know, the cheap ones that really aren't much use for tomatoes, but they're really good for these because you can cut them with wire cutters on one whole side and kind of split them open so they're not a circle anymore. They're like a big C and uh, stick them in the ground around the plants and, and they become almost invisible because the uh, plant's foliage hides them, but it really gives the plants a lot of support. Those pretty fall blooming uh, chrysanthemums you pay a lot for in the star store. If you plant them now, they'll be ready to go. You pinch back the foliage, if you, especially if you have some coming up from last year. I've got to go down and do that this year. You pinch back the foliage. Just keep pinching it back and pinching it back so that it's just a little ball. And, and, and then in July, just let it go. You'll end up forming a whole lot more flower buds on it. Now the gladiolus corms, some people leave them in the ground all winter. I hear sometimes you can get away with it, but most of the time you can't. So wait until the soil is warmed up to 55 degrees and then make consecutive planting so that you can get, you know, this flower blooming this week and that's, that one wanes, then you can get a new batch of flowers the next week. So you ask, how do you take the temperature of the soil? Well, they make soil thermometers but I'll bet every single one of you has a meat thermometer in the kitchen and that works pretty well too. Just make sure that if you use it, you uh, clean it up before you put it back in the drawer. And you guys make sure that your wife knows that you cleaned it or sneak it out and clean it before she does. So you can plant the dahlia tubers in late May, but the soil has to be a little bit warmer and the danger of frost should have passed by then, but make sure that you watch the uh, forecast. The tulips, daffodils, and hyacinths, chances are they're just about done. You can fertilize them while they're, the foliage is still there by using a few tablespoons of 10-10-10 soluble fertilizer or the equivalent bulb fertilizer and spread it around among where your uh, two plants are, your, I'm sorry, your bulb plants are planted. And leave the leaves on. I know they look terrible in your garden. I've got a bunch of daffodil uh, foliage out there and they're still nice and green but give it three weeks and they're going to look terrible. They're going to be all yellow and laying down and then I'll cut them off. What they are is little solar panels right now. They're collecting sunlight and they're making food for the bulb so that we'll have flowers next year. If you cut those off we won't. A lot of people when I was growing up used to braid them 
you know, take the tops of the daffodils or the tulips and braid them, but that cuts down on the amount of sunlight for photosynthesis, so you really don't want to do that either. Just put up with them for a little while. The big questions everybody has are about prunes and shrubs this year. Which ones do I prune? Which ones don't I? Well, here's a list and you will have access to this entire presentation and you'll be able to click the links to get more information. But these are the plants that you'll want to uh, be pruning this year if they need pruning. Don't prune them if they don't need to. You can deadhead them after they're done blooming. You can take the blossoms on off to tidy it up. But you don't need to prune something just because you're allowed to at that particular time. The thing all these plants have in common is that they bloom in the springtime. And the reason that this is the time to prune them is because after they're done blooming this year, they're already getting ready for next year. They're planting or they're starting the buds for the flowers that'll be showing up next May. And if you cut them off, if you prune this plant after or in the fall after say June or something like end of June, you're going to cut off next year's flowers. So be really careful about that. If they if it blooms in the spring, maybe into June, chances are it's okay to uh, prune before the end of June. Check out that list at Portland Nursery. It's a pretty good calendar for um, the plants that grow here. We get a lot of questions at the plant and insect clinic about why their so people's shrubs don't bloom in the spring. And it boils down to, for the most part, not planting it in the right place. And uh, the other reasons are the age of the shrub, and we'll go into these a little bit, environmental stress is a biggie. Um, improper fertilization and pruning at the wrong time like we just talked about and pesticide use. So sometimes people expect that uh, their plants should bloom. We, we got a lilac tree, um, a lilac bush oh, five years ago. It was blooming in the nursery and we brought it home and it didn't bloom again for three more years. And there's a couple reasons for that. For one thing, it just, you know, it was transplanted and need to, needed to get established. But the other thing is it was growing in pampered conditions in, in the nursery. And sure, it was able to bloom then because it was nice and warm and, and you know, conditions are absolutely perfect. Once we got into the real world, it said, nope, not going to do that yet. So it, it can take a while for a new tree to uh, bloom after transplanting. Rose of Sharon's may not start blooming for one to two years. Daphne's may not flower for a few years after planting. And Wygela may not bloom for a year or two after transplanting too. So that's to be expected. Some of these plants get really, really old and they, they just can't do it anymore if, if left to their own devices. At, at the corner of one of the streets where I pass to get onto I-5 to come to, uh, to come to Longview, there's a bunch of old lilacs and we've been watching those decline over the, the past 10 years. If those folks would do some rejuvenation pruning, um, I'll bet those plants would come back. But then again, it doesn't look like they're watering them in the summertime, so they might not come back. But the rejuvenation pruning, which we'll talk a little bit about in the next slide, um, it can delay blooming them for two or three years as the plant starts to reestablish itself and put it out a lot of new growth. Rejuvenation pruning is that severe pruning that you see when things, when the plants get really old and just, just need a perk up. There are two ways of doing it. One of them is the first one where you can just chop the whole darn thing down to about six to 10 inches from the ground. That is really, really hard on the tree because you know all those roots underneath the ground are used to having all the uh, photosynthesis, all the sugars going down to feed them. And now it doesn't. So it's going to take a while for that, that the roots to recover from not having all that um, nutrition. And it's going to put all of its energy into putting out foliage for the tree and reestablish or the bush and reestablishing it. So it'll be about three years before you get any flowers. On the other hand, you can do a slow motion and, you know, gradual approach and cut a third of them off 
branches off the first year. You can see that it's cut down just a third of them down there. And then the next year, as these are coming up, you can take off the other third and then the others. And that's a lot easier on the uh, plant and it's a lot easier on the roots and it looks a lot better. It doesn't look quite so stark. Environmental stress is a big thing. Um, I don't know if you've ever noticed the forsythias out in the fields. They come up pretty darn early and they're just beautiful. They're the first blooming shrub, maybe not the first, but one of the first blooming shrubs we have and it's just a brilliant yellow. Uh, it doesn't happen here too often, but back in Ohio where I grew up, the forsythias would be out there just they look like pink pop or yellow popcorn on the trees they were just gorgeous and then we get one of those deep hard freezes that would go down to five degrees and the blossoms would turn to a brown mush so that was it for the blossoms we, we just didn't have any that year and sometimes we never even got the flowers because the the buds would freeze off before they ever had a chance to open the good news is that some of the summer blooming shrubs like the uh, the hydrangeas, if the buds weren't injured, they should be fine. Environmental stress is probably the biggest problem we have here why uh, plants don't or shrubs don't uh, flower, why why um, fruits don't set on fruit trees. One of the first ones is not enough light. Uh, when you go to the nursery, make sure that you do your homework. If it says it needs full sun, it needs full sun. If it needs shade, that's what it needs. So make sure you read the label. Make sure that you've got the right place in your yard that it can get what it needs. These are some of the shrubs that need sun. And you can see the pictures there. Um, some of these you saw were also in the I need full sun category, but they can also put up with partial shade. Some of the um, rhododendrons and azaleas, and actually the hydrangeas too, don't like full sun, or at least don't like afternoon sun. Not enough water. This is probably the biggest problem we've had in the past five, six years. I think a lot of people here in the Pacific Northwest think that once the tree is established that it doesn't really need any water in the um, summer. I mean, we get lots of rain in the winter and the spring, don't we? Why should it need water in the summer? A lot of these shrubs have very, very shallow root systems. And if you let the soil dry out or if there's competition from other plants in the same area, those plants, those shrubs, and those trees are going to be um, have trouble getting enough water to stay healthy. And unfortunately, it's a cumulative damage too, because once the roots have suffered some drought uh, stress, it, uh, it kind of piles up over the years. And you can see that we've lost an awful lot of trees because of drought. You, you'll see trees declining and dying in yards. They need, they need frequent watering during the, the at least the first two to three years after they've been transplanted. But after that, they need one to one inch of water a week, or I'm sorry, every two weeks if there's no rain. If you mulch with um, something like arborist wood chips, that helps to keep the soil moister because it doesn't evaporate. And if you've got dry soil and heat really high heat like we've been getting some of those uh, we'll get a week or two of really really hot weather that makes it even worse but you have to be careful not to give it too much water because that'll drown the roots and you get the same appearance of uh, drought stress on the top of the leaves as you do with not enough water there's a problem with if it's um, if you drown the roots then the water that the plant needs above the ground isn't going to be able to get there either root problems and, and we kind of touched on that with the uh, with the watering situation. Root restrictions uh, are a problem sometimes. If you have overly wet 
soil like clay and the water doesn't drain, then they're basically sitting in a bowl without drainage and the roots will drown. Container bushes uh, that are root bound, if they're not planted correctly, then they just kind of circle around and they act like they're in a bowl. And again, they don't ever establish well. And you have to be careful if you're digging not to dig into some of the important roots. I've seen that happen too. Most of the shrubs don't need much in the way of fertilizer. If you put um, compost and some good mulch around it, it'll work its way into the soil. If you fertilize too much, you get a lot of green growth and you're not going to get flowers. And that, that's been a big problem because people really, you know, they think they're feeding their, their trees, their bushes, so they will flower, but normally they that just makes it worse. And it also has a tendency to attract aphids and other insects that really like that lush new green growth. And another problem you might see is if you plant the um, whatever shrub it is near to where your lawn is and you're fertilizing the lawn, it's not like the, you know, the roots of the bush can tell the difference. You know, they, they don't know that that's only for the, for the grass. They'll take it up too and you'll end up with um, with lush green growth and just not enough there for your uh, plants to bloom. Lavender is one that um, blooms later in the year. The pyracantha, some of the other ones. Improper pesticide use will make a problem too. It, you have to read the labels. For example, uh, this particular one, applications during bloom may damage flowers. And the, there's fungicides that'll do the same thing. Um, if you spray them on the, when they're, it's about to bloom or when they've just bloomed, it'll ruin the flowers. But the number one rule is to plant the right plant in the right place and make sure that you're giving it everything it needs. Uh, with camellias, you can get this cottony camellia scale and you can see that on roses too. St. Rose Church had a problem with the roses right outside their door. Somebody sent me a picture of that, and you, once you see camellia cotton scale, you'll never, yeah, you know, you'll never mistake it for anything else. What you want to do with these is to remove those from the leaf, or if they're you don't, if it's not on too many leaves, you can actually pick the leaves off. Um, you want to prune and destroy heavily infested branches and leaves, if possible, if you can do so without damaging the tree. Um, insecticides only work at one point in the scale, it's an in scale as an insect. It'll only work at one point in their lives where they're in the crawling stage. So you would have to um, check on the uh, check on that. Hort sense, if you could click on these links, I can't do that now because I'll um, I'll disrupt the presentation. But if you click on these links, this will take you to WSU's Hort Sense. And in that you will be given the uh, problem that you're looking at, it'll tell you about the insect's life cycle, it'll tell you what you can do culturally to take care of the plant, and then it'll give you pesticide, insecticide options if that is an option indeed. So these are really, really valuable links and I, I really hope that you'll be able to use them. The next one is the Photinia. I, I love the Photinia. I think that's one of the reasons why we moved out here. We came in um, February and March and they were just starting to turn that beautiful, brilliant color. But if you trim them back in mid-May, you'll get more of the red foliage. And if you have Photinia in your yard, you've probably seen spots form all over their leaves. There are two different kinds of spots. One is called physiological and they don't know why it happens, but it does and it makes the leaves look ugly. And then there's a, a, fun a fungus that'll do pretty much the same thing to the untrained eye, they look identical, and it makes the leaves look ugly. I would never grow a Photinia here, but I love looking at them in somebody else's yard. Um, the imported currant worm only gets on currant plants, but boy, they can just they could just eat through it like a salad, more like you know, more like a, a piece of cake or something, and they're sugar hounds. But they are they look like caterpillars but they're not. They're actually the a larval form of a little soft fly. 
and they can eat a whole leaf. You can watch it disappear, and the, these things get bigger before your eyes. Now, what happens after they get to a certain um, stage of development, they fall off the bush, and they go into the ground beneath the, the uh, bush to pupate. And then next spring, they come up, they, the, the adult comes up, the fly comes up, and then lays its eggs on the leaves, and the whole cycle starts again. Um, once the problem occurs, you should try to stay on top of it because the more of these things that reach that stage of maturity where they fall off the bush and pupate in the ground, the more you'll have next year. So go out there and squeeze them, take a bucket of soapy water and shake them off into the bucket, get rid of them. You can use insecticides. I, if you keep on top of it, you probably shouldn't have to because they're I mean, they're easy to see, and it's easy to take care of them. But you can use um, safer brand soap, and there's other uh, pesticides out there that contain a, some. Uh, it's a organic pesticide called uh, spinosad. But you have to be really careful about applying any of these. You need to read the label because if you don't, you're going to harm some of the bees and other pollinators. So it's absolutely essential. Anytime you use a fungicide or an insecticide, you have to be really careful about reading and following the instructions. One thing you can do next year, because these um, flies are going to come up out of the ground, right? That's where the, the uh, insect pupated. You can cover the ground or the bottom of the uh, plant with a row cover or a plastic bag or something, anything to keep those, the flies from laying eggs again. If you've ever had this problem, you'll notice that the, the larvae start from the bottom and move their way up the plant because the flies, you know, they didn't have to go far to find the leaves. They just, they just uh, laid their eggs on the leaves right close to the soil and then took off. So rhodos, uh, rhododendrons and azaleas, contrary to popular opinion, they are not full sun plants. They prefer dappled sunlight. They like well-drained soil. They need it moist all the time. And if they dry out, they have a very shallow root system. They will die or they will look like heck. And they also have trouble with weeds and trees in competition with them. So if you've got some uh, azaleas that are looking kind of sickly and they're kind of planted on the edge of, of, of a border and there are other trees and there's grass around it, and you're not keeping it watered, you're gonna lose that tree. They, they don't require a whole lot of care, but they do need dappled sunlight and protection from wind. And uh, if, if you do that, along with you know watering them in the summertime to keep them moist, about if, if you put your finger down into the soil, you know, take a screwdriver, make a hole for your finger and stick your finger down, down to the uh, knuckle and it's dry down there, it needs watered. Most of the roots of the rhododendrons and azaleas are in the first one foot of the soil. If you mulch around them, and, and again, apply compost and then put mulch over them, that's probably all they need. They probably don't need fertilizer. And the mulch helps to keep the moisture in, and that's really, really important. And you can deadhead the blooms like we were talking before. When they're done, get the rhododendrons, it's pretty easy. You can kind of pop them off with your finger when they're ready to go. And it'll take them down to about here, as you can see where this circle is. They have some problems here in the Pacific Northwest too. Um, if you see notching on the leaves like this, this is probably the root weevil they usually don't do a whole lot of damage to established plants, but they're hard to catch because they're nocturnal. If you'd like to be kind of enterprising, go out there, if you notice this on your plants, go out there at two o'clock in the morning with a headlamp, put a sheet underneath your plant and shake the, shake the bush really hard and you'll get a whole bunch of weevils fall on the sheet, take them out and dump them, you know, get them in the sheet and then dump them into a pail of soapy water to kill them. That will pretty much decimate your, um, your root weevil problems. And one of the biggest problems we've had in the past, I'd say five years, is azalea lace bug damage. 
there's also a rhododendron lace bug, but I haven't seen it damage the rhododendrons as much. I, I, I think their leaves must be just a little bit more, you know, firmer, more leathery. But if you see this on your azaleas, it's kind of a silvery, bleached out look to it. If you turn it over, the other side of the leaf will look kind of dirty. And if you look very closely, you might see some tiny little insects on the back. They're sucking the juice out of your leaves, and this is what it looks like. It's really hard to control because once it takes, you know, the, the eggs are laid on the underside of the leaves. The insects stay on the underside of the leaves. It's very hard to just wash them off, although that's the first line of defense. But since they're on the underside, it makes it difficult. You can prune off the uh, worst of the branches and then keep, you can use pesticides and there is a list on HortSense, if you click on this link, that they'll tell you what to use and make sure again that you read the instructions very carefully so you don't damage yourself, the environment, or the pollinators. And there are some problems that azaleas and rhododendrons come up with just in the environment. You can end up with leaf scorch, and that's what this is, marginal leaf necrosis. And that's usually from water stress, either too much or too little, or if you've got root damage, or if your soil pH is too high, although here in the Pacific Northwest, we don't usually have that problem because our soil is pretty acidic. And if you have it planted on a place where it gets really high winds, then that can happen too, especially if it's hot out. And again, planting the right plant in the right place usually avoids this. Now, physiologic leaf spot, do I have a picture? Yeah. That's what this is. And there's really, they aren't really sure what causes that. They think the cultural or environmental stresses may result in physiological leaf spot. And some of the varieties are more prone than others. If you have one that is prone and you can't, and it's not a disease and it just kind of looks like that most of the time, maybe plant something else around it or yank it out and replace it with something else. But if you plant something else around it, it kind of takes the attention off that one. And another, I'll bet you've seen this. Um, this is sunburn. And what happens is when these new leaves come out and they're really fresh and they're, they're pretty soft on top, they're, they're, they're not you know, kind of calloused to the environment right now, and it, we get one of those really, really hot days in spring, it'll burn the tissues. And it starts out with a, you know, with a little bit of dying off, and then later in the season it looks more like this, and you might even get holes in your leaves from the sunburn. Um, the outside leaves are usually the ones on the southern and southwestern sides of the plant that are most likely, or, or most severely in, uh, affected, and that's one of the ways you can tell that that's probably sun scald. And again, planting the right plant in the right place and not having them get that late afternoon sunlight is probably the best thing you can do to prevent that. And now rose problems. Everybody's got problems with roses, although I'll bet you we don't have nearly as many this year because we haven't had nearly as much rain. Here in the Pacific Northwest, we have a ton of fungal problems here because of the cold, wet conditions that are just absolutely perfect for fungal infections. Black spot is probably the most um, noticeable one. I think everybody's roses end up with black spot at some time or another. And you can see powdery mildew. That's the one on the bottom left. Um, Botrytis, you've seen that too. Botrytis is the same fungal infection that you see on strawberries that you buy at the store where it turns like a fuzzy gray color. And then rust. What these all have in common is that they are fungal infections and there are some rules of thumb that apply to all plants, but especially these to prevent any kind of fungal infections. One is kind of laughable. It's uh, you're, we're told to uh, avoid overhead watering, which is like impossible if you live in the Pacific Northwest because we have overhead watering all winter long and most of the spring too. But other than that, you should be space the plantings and, and prune so that you can get better air circulation. That really helps to limit disease development. 
and in general you want to prune out and destroy all diseased leaves and canes and don't compost the infected material because it can um, the spores can spread to to the plants rake and destroy all fallen leaves from underneath the plants again to keep those fungal spores from spreading and read the labels try to plant resistant varieties although resistant doesn't mean immune and don't over, don't over fertilize um, but that lush new growth you see these aphids that plant was probably fertilized and there was a flush of bright new growth and those aphids are just really attracted to that and the same thing happens with powdery mildew if you over fertilize something powdery mildew tends to form on the new lush growth if you um, you're going to fertilize use one of those uh, slow acting maybe an organic fertilizer that takes it in over time and just brings a little bit more organized growth so let's move on to the fruit trees there are a couple of really important tasks this year but we'll start with the uh, problem that I've seen on several people's trees this year and I think it's because we've had such warm weather and the cold nights they get splits in the trunk and you'll have sap running and eventually if you don't get a disease in that opening the tree will heal itself and hope, hopefully it will uh, contain the damage and doesn't uh, really interrupt the flow of the nutrients in the water in the plant one thing you can and this is caused by the heat of the sun on the uh, trunks of the trees and it makes all the uh, cells swell up with water because it feels like it's warming up and then it gets cold again at night really cold and the plant doesn't have a chance to adjust to the plant because that's where the sun is one way you can help to prevent that is to paint the trees with a half half mix of water and white latex paint from the ground up especially on young trees although this year I've seen it on some of the older trees two four and five and six year old plants it helps to reflect the heat of the Sun instead of absorbing it like the dark trunk of the tree does and another problem we've seen on uh, some years is really overproductive peaches and plum trees and, and apple trees actually too that weren't thinned the fruit wasn't thinned and the sheer weight of the fruit just broke the branches of the trees you'll get bigger fruit healthier fruit less chance of um, insect problems if you thin the fruit and there are specific guidelines for each fruit most of the time you prune them to oh six to eight inches depending what the plant is and there the fruit should be very small when you do it about the size of a nickel and I hope you'll take a look at that if you've got some fruit trees in your yard that you're taking care of some of the common problems of fruits that we're seeing in things like cherries peach and plum brown rot is one of them that's the first picture here this is really sad because it affects the uh, leaves the blossoms and the fruit and can uh, spread into the branches too which is really sad it will uh, destroy the, the buds for sure and it can it can ruin the fruit it can turn into little mummy fruits on the in the tree so what you want to do here is pretty much what we were talking about before prune out and destroy any infected uh, plant material that you see clean up underneath the tree get all the infected leaves up and again avoid overhead, overhead watering which is impossible if you do end up using fungicides um, make sure that you read the directions because you should be able to use some in the fall and some in the spring but they they are different what you use so go to the links HortSense will tell you exactly what you need to do and again follow all the just all the um, instructions now uh, corinium blight is a different kind of a fungus it's only on the leaves for the most part and it starts out with these little spots it doesn't look like a whole lot they're usually you know a little bit yellow and then they have the dark on the outside but later on after this plant tissue dies the, the tissue just drops out of the leaf plum tree there are holes in all the leaves and I can't find an insect and I said well I think it's a fungal disease called shot hole she says no no insects make that and I said nah, not this time so if you see this on your uh, peaches cherries or plums that's probably what it is and again you prune out the uh, infected 
places if you can. If not, again, there is a fungal uh, or a fungicide program that you can use to help to control that. This is the month that you want to be controlling for codling moth. If you have ever had this in your apple, you never want to have it again. The codling moth is a small, insignificant looking moth that lays its eggs on top of the, on the fruit and the larvae tunnels into the fruit, eats its way in there, and then it comes out leaving this big trail and then it pupates either to the ground or to the um, bark on the tree trunk to come up again next year. So what you need to do at the end of May is get one of these coddling moth traps. This is so that you can monitor whether or not you've had the problem. If you had the coddling moth problem last year, you're going to have it again this year if you didn't do anything to uh, take care of it. One of the things you, the most important thing you do to take care of that is get, as soon as you see a problem, get rid of that fruit. If you see a, something on the ground, a, a fallen apple on the ground, get it up. Don't let it stay there because it'll just, you know, create more of the same problem. So the hormone lure will catch the males and that tells you that you know you've got them around there. And then there's a, a, either you can spray or you can bag the fruit to protect them from the uh, moths laying their eggs on your fruit. Make sure that you look at the HortSense article and it'll give you precise information on how to take care of the problems. Showed up on my trees last spring and I think I missed the window of opportunity this year. I so use a thermometer, a soil thermometer, like we talked about before, your meat thermometer or whatever you have in your uh, drawer. Don't plant the summer vegetables like uh, tomatoes, squash, melons, and peppers and eggplants until the soil temperature is consistently above 70 degrees. Planting it before that, the plant will probably be okay. It may not, but it'll probably be okay, but it's just going to sit there. And the other thing about the soil temperature being too low is that it's uh, a lot of the nutrients aren't available to the plant when, when the temperature is that low. And you'll usually end up with the plant turning kind of purple because it's, it's not getting enough phosphorus. And it's only because of the temperature. The other problem, of course, is if, um, like if you planted three weeks ago when the weather's been so nice and you get one night of frost, you've lost your plant. There are ways to protect plants when you plant them out. Um, you cover them with a plastic bag when it's going to be that cold, or you can cover them with row cover fabric. And you can also help to preheat the soil by covering it with a clear plastic for about two weeks before you plant. That'll warm the soil up nicely and the roots will be able to you know, establish themselves a lot better. So, you should probably get to know your enemy. Um, HortSense has a really good guide, as does WSU. It talks about the different kind of problems that you might see in your garden and what to do about them. In fact, from what everything that I've read, you can do everything right, but if you don't have sunlight and dr somewhat dry soil, you're never going to get rid of the uh, moss completely. They like our acid soil. They like the fact that the nitrogen in our soil gets washed away every winter by the heavy, by the heavy rains. Um, if we aren't taking care of the lawn, we get bare spots and the moss just moves right in. There are some things that you can do. Let me go back. So mowing properly will help. It, it helps the grass put down longer roots, which makes the grass healthier. And, and helps it to grow, you know, more, more lushly. You can lime your soil in the fall. That'll help to control the acid, but it won't kill the moss. Um, irrigation, it likes to be wet. So try to create, if you have areas where it's very, very wet, try to do something to mitigate that, whether it's um, moderating the soil with organic amendments or putting in French drains. And the best time to actually to take care of the moss in your lawn is March through April. 
that's when the moss is actively growing. And if you rake or dethatch your lawn in those mossy areas, you can remove the dead grass stems and the moss. And then you should um, apply fertilizer as um, according to the what it says on the package for you and then spread lawn seed over the area and people want you to go straight to the chemicals to to get rid of the moss and that's really not recommended they suggest that you try the you know proper irrigation proper soil fertility mowing correctly and getting the sunshine in first before you try these others an environment fr environmentally friendly option is to apply products containing ferrous iron or ammonium sulfate from mid-March through April. And some of those are things like Lily Miller's uh, Moss Out for Lawns and Scott's Turf Builder with Moss Control, which is a 22 to 2 um, NPK uh, ratio. And if you apply one pound of actual nitrogen at each application from four to six times a year, for spring and fall, usually your grass will become very lush and will overgrow the mossy areas as long as they're getting sunlight. And I'm not going to cover this at all. Art's done a really good job of that. And here, here's a link to uh, the talk he gave. I think our biggest pets here, that at least the biggest concerns here, are the moles and the deer. And Art goes into a great deal of discussion about the uh, moles in his talk. And deer, deer are going to be with us always. And the only way that you can really deter a deer is to um, build a fence tall enough to keep him out. Anyway, I think that's about all I've got now. We have a lot of really good links here and you can contact Gary for the how to get the this a copy of this presentation and how to see our videos and some of the other handouts that we have. I hope this has been helpful to you and I want you to know that you're not alone. The, that um, you have HortSense. I've showed you some of the things that you can access there. PNW Handbooks is another excellent place to find information. If you don't want to look up, um, you know, don't don't want to, you know, just click on a link. If you just search for something and put WSU HortSense Apples, you're going to bring up the link to that, and you'll get the information without really having to go through one of these um, URLs. And we are at the plant and insect clinic to help you out. Um, we, aren't, we aren't in the office yet, so don't get the extension. But if you call this 360-577-3014 uh, or get in touch with this email address or Gary's email address, we can help you out and get you the answer that you need. Well, thank you for being here. I know you could have been doing something else. And I hope you learned a lot. And good gardening. Good luck with it. Thank you.